we cut off last week in the middle of uh, Cushing's career. Uh, <coughs> he had gotten here by working his way through Dartmouth and everything, and <coughs> which meant he seriously didn't have any family money and uh, had gotten on the faculty and <coughs> had turned out to be really, really good. Uh, a couple of faculty members who were with him when he was teaching here subsequently wrote memoirs in which they said he was the best lecturer they ever heard. And <clears throat> so because of the way the college was run at that time, the, the, there's half the trustees live really close and can come out and micromanage. And what you had was <clears throat> uh, about uh, eight trustees who were active and about four employees who taught the courses. And that, there was a clear vertical structure and the uh, board micromanaged everything. Now, <clears throat> um, Cushing is very agreeable. He was here 18 years and everybody who saw him said they had never seen him mad. He would not argue with people. He would only talk reasonably with them, and et cetera. But this man, he usually got what he wanted. And uh, the board was not entirely happy about putting him in at, even as acting president. But Moses Hogue, who had been the uh, president, had a sudden heart attack, and he was seriously not going to do this again. Um, and <clears throat> so we got to get somebody. And in fact, somebody has to sign the papers while we get somebody good. And uh, Cushing is, the year before they had just made him professor of uh, natural philosophy and chemistry, which made him the first professor. And remember, this, this is what I'm pretty sure was James Madison's idea to stop slicing the student body up horizontally and having a professor of the sophomore class and another professor of the junior class who taught every course the sophomores took and so on. And instead, hire people who had a, an extended knowledge in a specialty. And so the first one of these was, was the board was clearly impressed by uh, Cushing's amazing relationship with the students, and so they made him the first professor of uh, uh, natural philosophy and chemistry. And next year, Hogue dies, and somebody has to, they haven't made any more of these. Hogue dies, they have to put somebody in, they only got one professor who is obviously the first professor, uh, and he's going to have to be the interim president and sign the papers and things. And they weren't even too happy with that because um, by a long-standing agreement, the president of the college, who of course was always an ordained presbyterian minister, <coughs> was the pastor of college church. And we didn't have Saturday classes because on Saturday the faculty all who were all Presbyterian preachers, all prepared for preaching in their church. And sometime early Sunday morning, they all headed out for their church. And okay, you know, that's a, this is nice. Except now the president of the college is a layman. And not only does he not want to do this, there's no way the Presbyterian church will let him do that. So they have to think of something else. And what they think of, sorry, what somebody thinks of is hiring a graduate from two years earlier who has gone off to a theology school for a year and gotten his ticket punched. And he is now ordained and legal. And uh, Cushing hires him to come back and preach on Sundays out of Cushing's own pocket. Okay. <laughs> Not sure how long this is going to run, but there you are. <laughs> we have that problem solved. So they, they have now two things. One is they're having trouble, the college is having trouble because they got a guy who they really want to take the presidential job. He is 
one of the head theologians at Princeton Seminary. And they have approached him with all the money they got. And he keeps saying, mm, you know, I have to think about this a little more. Mm -hmm. Well, possibly. And it's been a year now since they appointed Cushing to keep the plow in the furrows. And this guy has still not agreed to anything. And the year turns into almost 18 months. And they give up and have a vote, which is split. But it's split between let's take Cushing and I don't like Cushing, but we don't have any alternatives. <laughs> and so Cushing becomes the real president. <clears throat> Switch gears. At that point, the Senate becomes really upset about this. It was okay as long as you had somebody ordained coming into the college church sermon, okay? Not going to have a layman who has never been baptized and we don't know anything about his personal faith, not going to have him run in the seminary. And at that point, the seminary had not separated off from Hampton Sydney. It was still part of Hampton Sydney. It was a theological department of Hampton Sydney College, like the chemistry department or whatever. And uh, they were not going to have a layman running that. So the idea of building a new, separate, new buildings, institution, that would be the uh, Virginia uh, Theological Seminary, this suddenly leaped up into first place in the Senate's thinking. And uh, they decided, and they had not quite decided to have it be at Hampton Sydney, because they might put it in Lexington, which they didn't ever intend, but some of them might give them money. And uh, so they suddenly decided that Hampton Sydney was okay. And uh, uh, Somebody, and I'm not sure whether it was the Senator of Virginia or one of the local uh, theology faculty, who uh, suggested that instead of Virginia having to pay for all this, Hamp Sydney was really pretty close to the North Carolina line, and if they presented it smoothly, they might get North Carolina to go in with Virginia and have a joint two-state uh, seminary, which each state would only have to pay for half of, uh, and <clears throat> that, that would be good, and we could call it Union Seminary. And this is, of course, a name that was thought of long before the Civil War came up. Uh, but <clears throat> anyway, so they said, yes, indeed, we'll have Union Seminary. In 1821, they formally announced that it was in place institutionally but not really. But they were starting, they had, between the two sentences, they had a lot of money. And they were starting construction at once. And so between 1821 and 1823, uh, <coughs> they built the front end of the seminary, the big building that would be the seminary, plus a couple of faculty houses. We'll get those in a minute here. But that was half of the building that uh, Cushing provoked. He didn't have to raise any money for it, okay? They, they, were, they were raising the money to avoid him, but still, it was his doing. They, they, would, they would have been years longer making the decision if he hadn't become president of Hampton Sydney. But there you are. Uh, there's construction going on on campus, and the campus looks like this at this point. Uh, the oval line is a pretty good representation of the land that the college bought in 1815. Uh, it butted right up to the original land grant, which, and that is an accurate map in the sense that uh, the college could have built Cushing where they did without buying any more land, but they had already decided that they wanted to be able to expand in a more general sense. This map is, of course, one that the college prepared in advance to get sight lines and things like communication routes for uh, when Pauli was put in. So this, this is really a current map, but all those little gray rectangles are buildings that have gone up since then. If you took that map back to 1820, it would have nothing but light green over the whole thing. There, it was open woods, 
and there were zero buildings anywhere. Not up on the top, not over at the right, not down at the bottom, you know, ain't nobody built nothing there. <clears throat> and they went, the college in 18, might have been in 1814, went to the landowner, who at that point I think was the son of the guy who'd given them the original 100 acres. And they said, mm, buy some land down there. And he said, okay, here you can have it for peanuts because I'm a loyal alumnus. So they bought it. But they did not advertise this fact much. And so when the Senate certainly suddenly wanted to have a seminary right next to him, Sydney College, they went to the board. First, they went and looked to see who the land belonged to, and it turned out it belonged to Hampton Sydney College, which was news to them. And <clears throat> they went to the board and said, how about selling some land so we can have the seminary right next to the college the same way Princeton did? And the board said, well, no, that's expansion land. We don't have any ideas right now, but we want to be able to put buildings up sometime. And so the Senate ground its teeth off flat and came down to the bottom here, as close as they could get to where Hampton Sydney was going to be, okay? They had not mind being up here, halfway up that red rectangle, but they came down to the bottom in 1820 and bought a strip of land that is only about, you're looking at all, it does not go off the screen to the bottom. It's a narrow strip of land but it was enough for the buildings they wanted to put up. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so what we get to here, come on. Yes. Uh, not necessarily the first, first building it put up, but close to the first because they built all three of these at once. It's what we call Penshurst. They called it North Carolina House, and I think you can imagine why, okay? But anyway, North Carolina paid for it, and if you know where to look, you can still see white paint on one of the chimneys that says North Carolina House. That paint has not been renewed for something like 150 years, but it hadn't fallen off either. Anyway, uh, the Penshurst was a faculty residence, and here's the seminary, okay, which you recognize, and uh, here's what we call Middle Court, which they call the first professor's house. I, I assume if we were there now, Sipe would have to move into it, but anyway. Uh, <coughs> Those were the three buildings they put up, and that was enough because just as uh, Cushing was going to be a college with everybody in it, living there, studying there, going to classes there and everything, uh, the needs were different, and so the building inside is built different. But basically what we call Venable <coughs> was the whole seminary's teaching uh, facilities. So, okay. So much for that. Now then, the uh, seminary is not the only place with uh, a prominent building program. And the difference is that the seminary has been built by two organizations which between them have plenty of money. Ham Sydney need to duplicate its campus because <clears throat> 50 years aware on buildings that were pretty much thrown together in the first place have destroyed it. I mean, nothing is usable anymore, even including the brick, uh, old college building because the stairways are wooden and they're, they're collapsing, okay? And the board said, oh, we gotta build a new college and we can't build it over where, put the new buildings over where the old ones are because we got to use the old ones until we get the new ones to use. And, uh, so we're going to have to build a whole new campus down here on that map, okay, on the, on the land we just bought. <clears throat> and that's going to take money. Now, what buildings do we need down there? Well, uh, we need a dining hall, okay? And 
the current dining hall for them was a very small building, too small, uh, in the front yard of what would later be uh, uh, Hamden House. Hamden House wasn't there then, but later on it would be. And they were going to have to tear it down anyway, and what they needed was a nice big new uh, dining hall. This looks kind of spare, and it's because I took the picture just before they tore it down. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, if you... The students looked at it and immediately called it the Alamo, not immediately, in 1837, called it the Alamo because all of them were used to looking at the pictures of the, the Alamo that were woodcuts in the newspaper they got. And so they thought it was funny and they called it the Alamo and it stayed that until they tore it down. Uh, <clears throat> Ham Sydney at that point did not name buildings. Buildings were named by their function. This was supposed to be this, either the steward's hall or the dining hall, whichever you called it, but one or the other of those. And it was until it became the Alamo and everybody gave up and called it the Alamo. Uh, this is the real Alamo. Uh, that's a woodcut that came out at the time. Uh, here it is in better shape at Hampton, Sydney. And you notice that there's a two-story front porch and you can actually go out on the second floor there and there's a railing around and on a cool, that's the east side of the building and on a, a pleasant summer evening, that's a nice place to sit. And the first floor was where you ate meals and <clears throat> the second floor was rented out sometimes to students, sometimes to faculty. And uh, here's a aerial photograph that shows you, since most of, well, half of you anyway have really never seen this. Um, yeah, oh, come on, stop sending it back. Uh, the reason White House is J-shaped instead of U-shaped is that when they built it, the Alamo was still there and there was a room, okay? So they built a J-shaped building. Uh, and then later tore the Alamo down. But you can see the uh, two-story arrangement and the uh, two-story porch and so on. Uh, what you can sort of see at the very back is that there's a little L coming off of that, which is not in a straight line. It's bent by about 15 degrees relative to the axis of the, the dining hall in front. That was the kitchen, but it had been built as a faculty residence before they thought they were going to have a new campus. This was the last thing for the old original campus, and so it was aligned with the buildings on the original campus, which meant it was pointing by about 15 degrees in the wrong direction when they wanted a dining hall. So they just bricked it up and kept going. The uh, residence was tiny, uh, <clears throat> but it, it was what they had money to build, and so it was about 400 square feet times two floors. It's 800 square feet in the whole house, but there you are. Uh, <clears throat> but it was big enough for a kitchen, and so the meals were cooked in the kitchen and brought out and everybody ate in the front, and the front w was big enough. You can see that's a fairly substantial building there, and the front was big enough that it only took them about two passes uh, to feed everybody. So, okay, pretty good. Uh, we have met the basic requirement, which is that everybody has to be able to eat meals. Now, we want to put up the college, and here it is, 1821, and we got the uh, dining hall not only built but paid for because, <clears throat> should say this, Cushing is the first president of the college that the board has ever sent out to raise money. Before that, the president has always been told, you stay on campus and teach your courses, we'll raise the money. But they needed people to go, they needed donations fast. And he was good and he was smooth and people liked him and so we'll send him out. And they set out to raise $30,000, which doesn't sound like much to you, but it was a lot to them. And <clears throat> in the entire history of Hampton-Sydney's financial relationship with the Senate of Virginia, 
which is over 100 years. Cushing's attempt to raise $30,000 is the only fundraising drive that ever met its goal in over 100 years. He went out and got them and taught his course and everything else, and he went out to get them on a horse, all right? So anyway, they always wanted to build this building. It, this building had been up since 1756, and Hampton City loved it so much. Now, in fact, the building they were looking at, come on, was this one, okay? What Hampton City was thinking about was a much simpler building because the one that's there now with all the right cupola and stuff has been burned down twice and each time it was burned down it got replaced for even more money and, and they hung things on it. But what Hampton Sydney wanted was this building again. Now, if you look at the number of windows, you suspect that Hampton Sydney is not going to get one quite that big, okay? We might be able to build something that looks like that, but it's going to be smaller. And <clears throat> that is true, but uh, when Princeton calculated the sleeping capacity of this. They got 140 some uh, beds, but that's by having three in each room. When you can't count the sleeping capacity of uh, Cushing in its original confirmation, it slept 76, but which is about half as many, but that's with two in each room. So yeah, Cushing is smaller, but not that much smaller. Uh, Cushing is also brick instead of stone. Come on. But here you are, okay? This is what we got. Looks almost exactly the same now as it did then. Uh, <clears throat> it's the Nassau building at Princeton is actually three stories with an English basement which has like uh, Graham Hall has the house. And that gives you the effect of four stories, but it really was a three-story building, plus a little extra money to jack the whole thing up. Uh, <clears throat> we built a four-story building because we did not put any basement in here. We thought about it, trying to plan for an English basement because that's what Princeton did. And it was gonna cost a bunch more money. So forget that. And we were going to have a, a, a cupola on top and a belfry. And that was going to cost money too. So didn't, didn't do any of these things, all right. <laughs> but we got something that was a very functional building. Uh, come on. Yeah, here we are. Here's uh, the original building in 1890, and the major change in those two photographs is going from black uh, color to black and white. But it does show you something about the construction of this. I mean, I know you know this, but Cushing is four stories on the ends and three stories in the middle, which makes it kind of difficult to make connections there. But the idea was that you, you would get three floors with high ceilings and uh, basically people were going to, faculty and students, were going to live out on the ends, first and fourth passage, and the two passages in the middle were going to be educational. And uh, some of them were in the four-story part, and they were classrooms. Okay, classrooms. Uh, in the three-story part, the buildings you need, <coughs> the rooms that you need a high ceiling for, or the assembly hall. You want to have chapel in the mornings. It's a hall that's going to be big enough for the whole student body to come in and sit down, you know, and you can't do that and have a low ceiling, basically. So, okay, that's got a high ceiling, and that's, that's just below the yellow oval there. Then on the second floor, we're doing chemistry. And again, remember this is being planned about 1821. But Cushing already has the moving and shaking going on enough 
that they plan a big ventilated chemistry lab. And if you blow that up, I, I have blown this picture up, the middle window in that oval has been raised about six inches and a board has been put in it with about a four inch hole in it. And that room was ventilated whatever way they could ventilate it because it smelled a high heaven, <laughs> okay. And then finally on top is another feature that the college had and in a way still has, but nothing like the same intensity. Uh, the college had two debating societies. <coughs> one of them founded by Samuel Stano Smith, who'd been in one at, at Princeton, in, and uh, the one he founded was founded in 1776, 78. Uh, the other one was founded by 1804, but they had both been around by 1820. They had both been around a good while. There were no fraternities. And I'm sorry, no extracurriculars. In order to have something other than studying textbooks, or well, studying your notes or whatever, uh, you, you pretty much had to join one of the debate societies. And so the debate societies each had about half of the student body, which at the time was 75 or 80 students, so each of them had sort of uh, 40 students. And you didn't have to join this, so there may have been a few guys who didn't, but the dudes weren't much, and uh, the impression I have is that everybody, when they showed up on campus, joined, bang. Uh, one of them was largely pre-ministerial, and the other one was largely non-ministerial, but that didn't represent any, any particular hostility, it just didn't <coughs> enjoy debating things with them. <coughs> the top floor with the high ceilings was divided up into two big rooms, <coughs> one for the philanthropic society and the, the other one for the, the other one was really weird. Anyway, the two, Societies each had their own room, and this was important because they charged dues. Not much, but they had 40 people a year coming in, okay? Uh, and they took the dues and bought books with them. And <clears throat> in the 1820s, the college did not have a library. They had a space in the original chemistry lab building. There was a second floor, which was supposed to be the library but there was no librarian, and so any decent books that got put there disappeared. Sorry. And if you wanted good books, you went to one of the two debating society libraries. Uh, by the time they broke up in the 1890s, we'll get to that, uh, each of them had somewhere around $15,000 worth of books. And the two debate society libraries together were something like 10 times as big as Hampton Sydney's had ever been. <laughs> so even in 1820, the handwriting was on the wall for the Hampton Sydney Library. And so they gave them those two spaces in a big lockable space with room to put the books in and read them and have debates and so on. So that, that was a very important use of space for them. Uh, <clears throat> The first patch down here in the right-hand end uh, got built first. And by 1824, it was finished all by itself. <laughs> they hadn't started building the next ones yet. Uh, so it's this spike sticking out of the ground, but it, all the seniors are now living in, in the new dormitory. And this is a big morale boost, although you have to listen in construction while they put the rest of it up. They didn't get it entirely finished until uh, 1831, but that was not bad. This is because it takes a while to get the money that uh, Cushing has brought in from his uh, missionary trips, basically. Uh, and come on. Now, let me uh, call your attention here about half the audience knows perfectly well what's going on here and what's coming, but that water tower is important. The half that doesn't know what's coming, remember you saw a water tower at the end of that building, okay? 
Uh, then, <coughs> with the uh, original billing program paid for, they were going to build a new president's house because the original president's house was small and it was frame and the president hadn't beat it up, but they had lent their spare bedroom out to everybody, student or faculty or visitor, for 50 years, and the, it was falling apart, okay? <clears throat> and so they really felt as if they needed to build a president a new house. But you know what? He wasn't married, so there's no hurry about this. But they get through with the other ones, and in the meantime, Cushkin is taken up with the daughter of one of the uh, trustees, and they get married, and <clears throat> uh, he's from New Hampshire and has basically hardly ever seen a black person, but she actually has a woman slave that, who belongs to her, and he is a, the reason that a reason that has been proposed for the state government never giving Hampson any money while Cushing was president is that Cushing was an avowed uh, abolitionist. And the Virginia <coughs> legislature didn't feel like giving the money to any school that had an abolitionist for president. And But <coughs> his wife had one slave and he did not free her. What he did do was put her out for clothes washing and, and uh, clean the house and so on, normal kinds of jobs for money, and took the money and spent it on college activities. He, uh, he bought a huge amount of chemical equipment with his own funds, which since he didn't inherit any, he only had whatever he or this poor woman made. <coughs> and which makes it remarkable that when they did get around to building this, they were building it between 1832 and 1834, which is a long time for something that's only a brick house. <coughs> and, uh, well, one reason is that they had a fire in the middle of the, uh, the middle of the construction. They had to start over. But uh, another thing is that they didn't have the money. And in the long run, Cushing paid almost half of the price of building the president's house himself from no family money. This was money he'd put in the kitty. And uh, that kind of us where you are, okay? Uh, now, the, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of bad pictures here. Uh, this is a picture uh, sort of from the front, kind of from the same angle, but further away than that one you uh, just saw. Uh, this obviously is before the gymnasium thing has been put on the back of it. Uh, this is about somewhere around 1850. Uh, Venable Hall, that is the seminary, is right at the edge of the photograph over here behind the trees. And you can see there's flat out nothing in, in there except a few trees. About 11 trees are between uh, the president's house, Graham, the president's house, and uh, Venable. And from the back, and I really have to apologize for this one. I, this is a, a better picture than this, but not much better. And by the time I reproduce it, I can't improve this. But this is the back side of it. And you can see that to the extent you can see anything at all, it looks exactly like the front. This is a very simple uh, square house. Uh, what you can notice uh, is that there are, in this picture, which is the authentic building, the end of the house only has one window on it, on each floor. And that's because on the rooms on either side each have their own chimney because that's how you heat the house. And okay, that's so on. But if you go back, uh, notice that <laughs> somewhere in here they put in central heat. And when they did, they took out the fireplace and put windows in. And uh, that's... Uh, <laughs> That's how it has changed, although we like to think it hadn't changed much. Uh, but that's what you've seen is six buildings that 
Cushing had basically the responsibility for the construction of. He didn't have any responsibility with, for the seminary buildings with respect to fundraising, but he had the responsibility because they were doing it to keep him from ever signing anything relating to the seminary. But the uh, buildings, he was hugely effective at raising money for the college buildings. And the, the uh, <coughs> board was very grateful because at least some of them had the experience of seeing a church not give money again and again. And it was really neat to see some money actually flowing in. Now, the other thing, <laughs> building the way, campus the way it would be for um, 70 years, and the way it still is to a significant extent, <clears throat> is a real achievement. But the other thing I want to alert you to is what Cushing did to the intellectual structure of the college. Uh, does everybody have one of these uh, historical document thingies? There's some in the box up there if you don't have one. Uh, <clears throat> Basically, uh, what Cushing did, you're going to need this in just a minute. What Cushing did uh, upon going on the board was to, <clears throat> and nobody says who's responsible for setting this committee up, but somebody set up a three man committee on the board to review the college's bylaws and see if any of them needed to be updated. And for the committee, they appointed Cushing and two faculty members. And what I would say, basically, <clears throat> is the two faculty members never knew what hit them. Because <clears throat> there's, I would have given it to you, but he had 27 pages on small pages, 27 pages of fine print of bylaws, and even, even with me cramming them down to fit them on this page, it was still five pages, and I figured you weren't that interested in the bylaws. So I just want to read you a few of them. Uh, <clears throat> but the power structure in the college had always been trustees on top. They live close and can drive in two or three times a week. They can do micromanagement. And the faculty are just employees who are here to teach courses that the uh, trustees tell them to teach. Okay? Uh, okay. Uh, what do I do with my glasses? This is bad. Well, they're the wrong glasses, but we'll live with it. Uh, the, uh, he's got seven chapters. Uh, one chapter was a uh, degree requirements for graduation, and I want you to look at that. But <clears throat> that's chap chapter two. Chapter one is officers of the college. Article one, up front, the officers of a college who are to administer its government and conduct its instruction are the president, professors, and tutors who shall be styled the faculty of the college. And that last little part sounds strange. I mean, duh, of course they're styled the faculty of the college. Well, not of course. The word faculty, uh, when it first was applied to colleges, to only refer to a specific kind of knowledge. You had a French faculty and you <coughs> had a natural history faculty or something like that. Nobody referred to everybody who taught at X college as being the faculty of X college. That usage only showed up just about the time Hamp Sydney was founded. So he is, by going to that, he is including the president and the professors, but also the, notice the tutors. The tutors are the guys who are hired cheap. They're like roadrunners in the, in the uh, admissions office. The tutors are the people who teach the remedial courses to get you up to where you can become a freshman. Because Hampton Sydney had run, like every other college, had run a grammar school because there was no way to tell what the level of preparation of any individual student is. And 
if you want to have anybody in your freshman class, you're going to have to put them there. And so the tutors assisted at that. But the interesting thing is that they're part of the faculty. And uh, <clears throat> this is not an idea the trustees would ever have had. But here you are at item number one. Uh, the president is ex officio, president of the faculty. He is to preside <coughs> examinations and commence and to confer all degrees. Well, duh, again, except the board used to do that. This is the president who, by definition, is in the faculty when the trustees are not, okay? Uh, to the first professor is committed the instruction of the classes in natural philosophy and chemistry. Okay, we're going to build the existence of this office with vertical slices through the student body instead of horizontal. We're going to build this into the bylaws. You cannot change back, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Such other branches of learning as may be assigned to him by the trustees. Okay. Yeah, he's natural history, but he'll do other stuff if you need him. Um, and there's some more stuff there. Uh, <clears throat> to the professor of mathematics is committed the instructions of the classes in that science and in such other branches that may be assigned to him. We don't have this man. He doesn't exist yet, but he's going to. To the professor of languages, which means Greek and Latin, not French. To the professor of languages is committed the instruction of the class in the Latin and Greek languages and in such other branches that may be assigned to him. We don't have him either. We got people teaching those classes, but nobody has been appointed professor of Greek and Latin, okay? Uh, he is building this in, he's building this job structure into the bylaws. It's a, duty of the tutors to teach the grammar school and such classes in college as may be assigned them. Aha. Uh -huh. We can have, instead of having a faculty of four, we can have a faculty of four and a half because we can have one of these flunkies who's doing the uh, remedial courses come up and teach half a load and, and at that point <coughs> we suddenly have four and a half faculty members. That also is an idea that had not it's a perfectly obvious one, but it, it did not draw much water around that, didn't it? Um, the president at his direction shall have authority to appoint meetings of the faculty. <clears throat> All matters which by law are referred to the faculty shall be brought before such meetings and decided by a majority of the members present. Okay. Now remember that there are only five people on the faculty, well, maybe six, five or six on the faculty. And this, is a, this is a very small meeting, which you can have with a phone booth. And you're going to have a majority vote. And if it's tied, then the president gets to vote. Okay, But anyway, uh, but everything that relates to running the college is decided at a faculty meeting. Now, that sounds perfectly reasonable to people that teach here because, you know, I'm tired of going to these meetings, but it, 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 somebody needs to do this stuff. Cushing is why. The faculty shall keep a book of records or minutes and appoint a clerk. I have pointed this out to Patrick Wilson. Who shall enter therein a fair statement of their transactions, which book? The clerk shall lay before the trustees at each of their stated meetings, if required. So the trustees need to be told about this, but they don't get to veto stuff. Uh, second thing, chapter two, is where this book comes in. If you look at the uh, page 15, which is not the back cover, but the inside back cover, this is the language from chapter two of the bylaws. And if you sort of compare what's in on page 15 with the curriculum for 1812, which is over here to the left, it's pretty much the same courses. Um, I mean, it hadn't changed that much. All the people who thought uh, 
Cushing was going to secularize education at the college and there would never be any Christian education again. Not true. Uh, he actually, the Bible content of Cushing's curriculum here, and believe me, the trustees didn't think this one up either. Uh, the Bible content is about the same as, or maybe even just a weeny bit bigger than the 1812 curriculum. So their fears went for nothing. But why is this, look at this page, and then at page 14, why is there, does it take two whole pages to do the same curriculum here? What's different about this? And the answer is that Cushing is specifying textbooks. The academy attached to college, that is to say the grammar school. Adam's Latin Grammar, that's a book by Adam on how to speak and write Latin. Uh, Hackenberg's Greek Grammar, Lemprier's Classical Dictionary, Tuke's Pantheon, and Adam's Roman Antiquities. Okay, he's going through here specifying books for every course. And I've asked around a few faculty members, and these are good books. I mean, they were then. The, he is picking top-notch textbooks, and he's listing them in what amounts to a bylaw. So that if you're teaching one of these courses, you are going to use that book because you've got no choice, basically. And <clears throat> you need to realize that uh, textbooks, in some sense, had been around since 1500s, pretty much after printing was invented. But <clears throat> They tend to be language introductions. It's how you get from English to Latin or something like that. There are not many books that are intended as an introduction to something like economics or foreign affairs. That is a perfectly reasonable uh, ground of study, but you, you don't want to read the the official up-to-date literature on that, okay? Those textbooks were relatively new in the 18th century. 1750, you started seeing some of these, but uh, wood pulp paper had not been invented, and uh, rag paper was pretty expensive, and so these books were kind of expensive when you had them, and not everybody used them. Quite a few faculty members still went in class uh, with their gown on and nothing else, maybe some notes, and gave a lecture for an hour. And the students came to class with a pad of paper and a pen and ink. Uh, how you carry an ink around, I have no idea, but anyway, they came in prepared to write stuff down and they wrote out a whole textbook during the course of the semester because the guy didn't use a textbook and you wrote down what he said and that was how you learn things. That happened up to the early 19th century. And Cushing is determined to stamp that out by insisting on a textbook. Now, it helps the student have them in the list here because the student can go to a bookstore and buy them if he's in any kind of city. And if you come to Hampton City and don't have the textbook, <laughs> you're gonna have to write a letter to the bookstore in Petersburg and ask them to uh, ship it to you in the mail. Uh, anyway, uh, what he does is to raise the standards for the faculty and at the same time transfer responsibility for the college to the faculty. Uh, he changes the focus uh, completely. And uh, there's just one or two more of these that I want to read you. Uh, this one's important. Uh, for admission into the college, candidates for admission to either of the classes, that is grammar school or uh, college, are examined by the faculty. To be received as a freshman class, the candidate must be thoroughly acquainted, blah, 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 long list of things you need to be in the freshman class. But this is a decision the faculty makes. The faculty, there is in effect a faculty admissions committee, which was a whole, since there are only about five people, it was undoubtedly the whole faculty, but there you are. Uh, that was a novelty. Before that, it had been an open-door policy. 
Uh, this is a good one. You have to pay close attention to this. Any student not willing to maintain, to obtain a regular education, but to receive instruction in some particular branches of science, may join any class for which he is prepared. And during his connection, shall be subject to all the regulations of that class. He is inventing a BS degree, okay? It's just that nobody's going to give a BS degree, and he can't get away with making this meet the requirements for graduation. But he can set it up so that you can come to Hampton Sydney and take two science courses and a math course at once and uh, skip the, uh, French, the Greek and the, uh, a lot of other stuff. Just, this is amazing for, for the time. Uh, Ah, before a student can have his name entered on the college roll, he must, in the presence of the faculty and students, answer in the affirmative the following questions. Have you read and understood the laws of this institution? Do you acknowledge your obligation to obey them? After this, the student shall be required to sign to the following form, to be kept <laughs> in the book for that purpose by the faculty. I, you know, anyway, this is the origin of the honor code. You are signing that you have either read or at least heard all of the bylaws, all of the laws referring to the college, and you agree to be bound by them. Uh, that, that's a, an important thing to do. Uh, and, well, it's past 1220, I better quit. But you get the idea of uh, what Cushing did in the rewrite of the bylaws was to transfer the college from uh, a stodgy uh, arrangement run by the board of trustees, most of whom had never taught a course, to an organization run by the people who were directly involved. And the things the faculty is responsible for now are a really good product of this man. Uh, last thing, I, it's 1222 here, but uh, he died at age 42 because he had really bad bronchial problems. And they finally moved, he died in Raleigh and they buried him there. And in 1954, they finally moved him back to College Church Cemetery. And they buried him down in the bottom of the cemetery, sort of across from the safe guy house. And when the reburial was over, and people were kind of, they had a decent crowd, and people were kind of leaving. The Theta guys came out on the front porch with a phonograph turned all the way up and played when the saints go marching in, <laughs> which I think was cool. Anyway, next week is the other famous chemist who was here, and we'll get him. Thank you. Thank you. Onward, Thank you. Onward.